invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We are in our summer series going verse by verse through Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to begin in verse 23 today. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. Now we're going to be in Hebrews, and then we're also going to go back uh, all the way to the second book of the Bible, to Exodus. And so just so you're ready uh, for, for this journey, man, uh, I hope you, you brought your seatbelt, man. You buckled up. You're ready to go. Everybody ready to go here? Okay, cool. A couple of people don't quite know what's going on, and, and, and you're going to get there, I promise. But Hebrews chapter 11, man, that's, that's where we're going to be. That's where we're going to be, and then uh, we're going we're gonna to take over to head over to Exodus here in just, just a moment. And, and the purpose of that is, is really to have a stronger foundation of context. How many of you know context is king? Context is king. And so we want to make sure that we're preaching and teaching uh, the Bible in context and, and also helping us as we understand what the author under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is writing in Hebrews and how it connects to both the historical and biblical narrative that we discover in the book of Exodus. And so that's why we're going to kind of go back and forth uh, today. So Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to begin in verse 23. And we're talking, uh, uh, looking at the life of Moses. And we're looking at the life of Moses and saying, here's Moses who obeyed and lived a life of faith. And so, Lord, help us to be uh, uh, like Moses and have a, a stronger obedience and life of faith. And, and so there's things that we can pull from his life that, uh, that we can, as we prayed and as we live out the mission of discovery, become fully devoted followers of, of Christ Jesus. And so Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, by faith, everyone say, by faith. By faith, by faith Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. And so we, we start right here. Let's just, let's start right here. I believe the thread that we're going to see in verses 23 through 29 is that of a, a choice to obey. I must choose to obey by faith. As believers of the living God, as followers of Christ Jesus, we must choose to obey by faith. Each day that we wake up, we have a choice to make. In fact, we have many choices to make. Did you know that there's somewhere in the realm I've heard of 10,000 decisions that we make daily? 10,000 decisions. Can you just imagine? Uh, that's why doing certain things the night before in preparation for the next day is important because it reduces that number. I don't know how dramatically it reduces it, but at least for me, it's a better start to the day. So, like, I, I know what I'm wearing the next day. I don't have to sit here and, like, think, okay, what am I wearing? What meetings do I have? All those kinds of things. A anybody else out there? Okay. All right, cool. A couple people. You with me? But we all have choices to make. And we take it one step further. We all have choices to either walk in obedience or walk in disobedience when it comes to, to, to Christ Jesus. And really when it comes to any area of life. In the workplace, you, you have choices to make. You're going to do what you're supposed to do, what your job entails, or you're going to just not do it and <laughs> do other things, right? I, I mean, you know, you know where I'm at. We, we all have choices. We have choices. And, and I must choose to obey by faith. We really see this lived out in Moses' life. But it started, it started with Moses' parents. Did you see that? By faith, verse 23, by faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. Uh, the choice of Moses' parents was to obey by faith. And so let's go to Exodus chapter 1 for a little bit of context. A little bit of context in, in chapter 1. Last week, John Gizzi brought a message on the life of Joseph uh, from Hebrews 11. And we see that chapter 1 of Exodus uh, begins with Joseph and all his brothers, verse 6. And all that generation eventually died. But the Israelites were fruitful increased rapidly, multiplied, and became extremely numerous so that the land was filled with them. So the Israelites are living in Egypt 
uh, and they're under oppression. They're in slavery here in Egypt. Uh, the Egyptians are literally working them to death. However, the interesting part is that even with all that they're going through, they're still growing, they're still increasing, they're still multiplying. Uh, and so we see, according to verse 8, new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. And, and, and he said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and powerful than we are. And so you with me? So the, the new king, he, he's like, hey, I don't know what's going on here, but we something has to change. Something has to happen. Because the Israelites are growing in population. They're now larger than we are as Egyptians. And, and how easy would it be for them to revolt, right, uh, and, to, and to overtake us? And so what does he put in order? Well, before we find out what, what he puts to order, one of my favorite verses is verse 12 of chapter 1. Verse 12 of chapter 1. The more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied. Man, those words just jumped off the pages to me. The more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied. The more the Israelites were oppressed, the more they multiplied. Uh, they, didn't just, they, they didn't just give up. They didn't just give up. But they continued to actually thrive under the oppression of the Egyptians, the more they oppress them, the more they multiply. What a word to us that, that, that we have decisions to make when we're tested and when we're tried. And most of the time, we want to just kind of give up, right? We want to kind of, we want to go into that depression. We want to go into that dark place. We just want to throw in the towel. And how many of us today know that we have a God that's not giving up on us, a God that's giving us the strength that we need, a God whose grace is sufficient, a God whose love is unconditional, a God who will never leave us nor forsake us, who will never turn his back on us or abandon us. I don't know what you're going through today, but that speaks volumes to, to me. That's an encouragement to, to me personally that no matter what I walk through, no matter the, the, the test, if they keep on coming, which I, I, they're going to keep on coming, man, I can be assured to have confidence and be able to actually thrive in the midst of the test. Where the world would say, no, 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 don't thrive, just try to survive through the test. And we see it in the life of the Israelites and that they were able to thrive in the midst of the test. And so again, we're laying the foundation to, to where we're at in verse 23 of Hebrews 11, by faith Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful, that, that word means good uh, and pleasant, both Hebrew and Greek, and they, they, they didn't fear the king's edict. Now what's the king's edict? What, what is the, the king and those ruling, what are they going to put in place to, to cause, uh, uh, um, to, to slow down the the population, the Israelites' population. What is he going to put in the place? We see it right here in chapter 1. You with me? Chapter 1, Exodus, chapter 1. We, we see what he puts into to place. Verse 16. When you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. So the Egyptians are like, hey, we're good. We're good with the, the, the girls, right? They grow up to be women, and that's better for the men that are ruling, right? The more women, it's cra craziness. But the men kill them because they can grow up and they can overtake us, right? So God was good to the midwives, and people multiplied and became very numerous. Pharaoh then commanded all his people, you must throw every son born to the Hebrews into the Nile, but let every daughter live. And then we come to chapter 2. We come to chapter 2, and we see Moses' parents. Moses' parents. We, we, we don't see any names. We see no-name parents. But, uh, but we see, according to Hebrews chapter 11 and Exodus chapter 2, we see how the story unfolds. We see that the mother spends about three months, puts the baby in a basket. We see that in verse 3. Puts Moses in a basket, covers the basket, sends him down the Nile. She didn't just throw the baby in the river. And what's interesting to me as, we, as I read through these, these pages is 
One, it points back to the sovereignty of God. I mean, just imagine putting a baby in a basket, sending the baby down the river, especially the Nile. There's crocodiles. There's water, (laughs) right? Uh, There's suffocation. I mean, how many different things could happen to this baby? But then, out of nowhere, the Pharaoh's daughter just so happens to be bathing in that exact spot. This basket comes right into the area where she's bathing, and she picks the baby up. According to verse 10, names him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. I, I get, do, do you see, do you see the, the sovereignty of God? Sovereignty meaning God's ruling and reigning over all creation. He's in every detail. He's created every detail. Uh, and, and, and you think he's not aware of what you're going through. No, 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 no. He's quite aware of what you're going through. I, how many times before Moses even grows up to be the man to stand against the Egyptians, do, do, do we see that, that, man, he wasn't promised another day. He wasn't promised another moment. It all comes back to the, the choice of his parents to put him in this basket and to send him down this river. Look at verse 24, Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20, 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, now, when Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter uh, and chose to be identified with God's people, the, the, the Israelites, he chose to suffer, and we see at least three ways that he chose to suffer. The first way that he chose to suffer was through the pain of alienation from his adoptive family. The pain of alienation from his adoptive family. When he, when he chose to, to, to no longer be called Pharaoh's daughter, when he chose to stand up uh, for, the, for his people, the Israelite people, when they were under oppression, when, they, when he saw that the Egyptians were not treating them fairly, uh, uh, what did he do? He stepped out and he, he killed that Egyptian. He thought no one was looking around. Right? How many times do we react in, in, in a way when we think no one's looking and, and I'll get away with this, right? Uh, but we come to discover that the eyes of the Lord are watching over the both good and the evil. And so even if no, none of us are watching, none of us are looking, your friends or family aren't watching, guess what? There is a God who is watching. Right? He, he, he's watching every move that, that we make. So he buries this Egyptian. Next day... He kind of comes back out in the area, and what do we see in Scripture? We see in chapter 2 of Exodus, we see that there's Hebrew men that say, hey, are you going to do the same thing that you did that Egyptian yesterday? And so what does he do? Word gets back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh wants him dead, and so Moses, he, he flees. He flees. And so he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He, he suffers the pain of alienation from his adoptive family. This is the family that he grew up in. Second, Moses chose to suffer the, the loss of the world's honors, pleasures, and wealth. I mean, he had everything at disposal in this palace, right? He had everything. I mean, he had servants, money, the best food. W- whatever he wanted, he, he had accessible. But when he made that decision to obey God by faith, to stand up for the Israelite people, he suffered and lost the world's honors, pleasures, and wealth. He made the decision. And then thirdly, we see that Moses chose to suffer, being identified with the despised bunch of slaves. So his identity would change. He would now be identified with, uh, 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 with the group of slaves. By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughters. Look at verse 25, Hebrews 11, verse 25. And chose to suffer with the people of God rather, you with me, rather than, than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. That's what we just talked about, right? We just talked about that. He chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. 
He made a decision. Verse 26, for he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt since he was looking ahead to the reward. He, he said, I'm moving away from the materialism because I choose to obey by faith. I choose to obey by faith. I know that there's something better coming. There's something of lasting significance. And so I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to hold on to that by faith. I choose to be obedient by faith. The choice to obey God by faith, listen, will result in short-term suffering. That's not the best news, right? Can we just be, can we just be honest right, here today? Uh, that's not the best news. Right, so, Tim, what you're saying is, I'm making a decision to bring suffering in my life. The answer is yes. Okay, yes. It's a short-term suffering. Why? Because you're making a decision that I'm, I'm going to go against what the world says, and I'm going to follow what God's Word says. I'm making a decision to be obedient by, by faith. And Jesus himself said, in this life there will be trials and tribulations. And so if you're looking for, man, I surrender my life over to Jesus and everything's easy after that, that's just not the case. And can I just uh, add on to that? There's something that beautiful happens in you and in me in the suffering. There's something, something happens in us. Man, it builds our character. Builds our character. Builds our perseverance. We're able to endure. People are able to look at us and say, how can you keep going in the midst of this struggle? Man, all the stuff that you're going through. And all we can do is say, you know what? I, I, all I can do is say, it's Jesus and only Jesus. And so we point all the glory to God and we can't keep it to ourselves. The choice to obey God by faith will result in short-term suffering. But listen, there's good news. There's, there's good news. But also... And eternal blessings. And listen, we, we really don't have that eternal perspective. If we're honest with each other and, and ourselves, most of the time we're not thinking through the lens of eternal perspective. Right? The, 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 the eternal blessings, the rewards in heaven. We, we, we don't think about that because we're living for like, what's now? What's now? That instant gratification. I mean, that's why we've moved away from drive throughs to like the Grubhub in, in uh, whatever the other names are, you know. I can just, like, just pull it up on my phone, right? You know what I'm saying? Pull it up on my phone. Somebody can bring it to me. I don't even have to get out of my car. I don't have to get in my car and drive somewhere. They'll bring it to me. Where is that coming from? That's coming from the selfish part of our beings, right? Serve me. Serve me. And so, so many times we don't have an eternal perspective. And may, may the church finally take a stand and say, you know what? I, I, I have a... Eternal perspective, that there's something better, there's something greater, there's something that will last, there's something of substance and value. Come, come and follow me. Man, come and follow me. I must choose to obey by faith. I must choose to obey by faith. Moses' choice was to obey God by, by faith. To obey God by faith. See, faith calls us to experience the uncomfortable. Faith always calls us to experience the uncomfortable. If, if you're not uncomfortable, can, I, I know this might be a little hard, but, but if you're not uncomfortable, it, it's possible that you're not living a life of faith. That's the reality. That's just, as I see scripture, that's, what I, that's one of the things I gather. So faith calls us to experience the uncomfortable. See, Satan doesn't want us to, uh, he wants us comfortable. Man, in that comfort, we're, we're distracted from eternity. And, and, and as we look at Scripture, we, 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 we see this call to live a life of faith. Saying, God, stretch us. Do whatever you need to do in us. Develop us. I want to be more like you. I want to trust you. Because it's in that, it's in that, that we can't do this thing on our own. It's, it, it's in those moments that we're saying, God, I desperately need you to come through, right? That's what faith is. God, I'm relying on you to come through. I, I'm taking steps as you lead me. I want to be obedient to you, and you're going to come. You're going to come through. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Would you write this reference down? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. 
therefore we do not give up. I mean, I love those words. Therefore we do not give up. Some of you today, you're, on the, you're right on the, I mean, the edge and you're wanting to give up. Hey, hear this word from the Lord today. Don't. <laughs> Don't give up. Keep trusting God. Keep moving forward. If you don't know what else to do, listen. Develop stronger relationship with the living God. Spend more time with Jesus and less time with other people. If you don't know your next step, spend more time with Jesus. Develop the relationship with Jesus. And I believe with everything in me that he will speak, that he will show you your next step. Therefore, we do not give up. Listen, even though, Scripture verse 16, even though our outer person is being destroyed, the outside, the outside's being destroyed. Don't miss this. Our inner person is being renewed day by day. Do you see that? Although our outside, the, the, the outer person, the flesh, the brokenness is being destroyed. Our inner person is being renewed day by day. Listen, verse 17. For our momentary, turn to the person next to you and let them know momentary. Momentary, come on. Let them know momentary. For our momentary, light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable, eternal weight of glory. Do you see that in verse 17? Now some of you are saying, Tim, Paul is making this mockery. He doesn't know my life, Right? I mean, so we could read that and we could, we could instantly go there. But if there's anyone that could ever say a truth like this, it would be Paul. Why? As you read through the New Testament in his letter, what we discover, especially the book of Acts, we discover that everywhere he went, he suffered. Everywhere he went, he suffered. The, the man who once persecuted the church, at the moment he surrendered his life over Christ, was now the persecuting. Like, like, he endured suffering after suffering after suffering. And he says this truth. Our momentary light affliction, what you're going through right here, right now, is, is nothing compared to eternity. It's nothing in compared to eternity. Hey, let's change our perspective. Let's change our focus. Let's take it off from the world and, and put it on Jesus. Let's take it off of what we're dealing with right now and, and look through the lens of heaven. What a glorious day, one day surrounding the throne of grace for all eternity. Look at verse 27. Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. By faith, he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger, Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. Don't miss those words. One who sees him who is invisible. We see in chapter 3 of Exodus that Moses had this encounter with Creator God. And it kind of came in a way that, that you, I mean, we, we want to we dream this out. We want to plan this out, right? God came to Moses a burning bush. I mean, he's over here doing his thing, Mount Horeb, Mountain of God. He looks over, Moses sees this bush. He sees that it's on fire, but he sees the leaves aren't burning, right? How many of us, we, we, we all agree, leaves should be burning if a bush is on fire, okay? Can we, we had a bonfire the other night. If, if the leaves were burning, there's a problem, right? This thing is not right. And, and, so, and so he's looking over, he sees it, he's like, something's up with this thing. I don't know what it is. He gets closer, and what happens? And God begins to speak. God begins to speak. He says, hey, take your, take your sandals off this holy ground that you're standing on. And so in that encounter, God calls him to go back to Egypt, right? He sees he's, he's fleeing. He calls him to go back to Egypt. He says, I got, I got a calling in your life. Man, I got a calling in your life. I want you to go back. You're going to free my people walk my people out of Egypt and from slavery into freedom. And then he begins to question God. Any of us ever questioned God? I mean, God said, hey, I want you to move here. I want you to do something. I got this next for you. And we're like, no, nah, I don't know about that, God. Right? Can you just imagine? I mean, you want me to go back to the place where Pharaoh wants to kill me? The people, the Israelite people don't even like me. They threaten 
you know, they, they, they send threats. There's over 2 million people. How am I going to walk these 2 million people just out of Egypt? I mean, could you imagine the question? He gets arguing with God, and what is God's response, man? I am who I am. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. I am. Pharaoh asks, tell him I am, Simple. Hey, I don't know what you're walking through today. But as we look to Scripture, the authority of Scripture, man, we can be confident in one thing, and it's not you, and it's not me. It's not your gifts, it's not my gifts. Listen, we can be confident in one thing. I am. He is who He says He is. His promises are true. And He will never fail you. He will never fail me. I am. I am. Verse 28. Hebrews 11, verse 28. By faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. So, so he takes God out of word. He heads back to Egypt. He goes to Pharaoh. Of course Pharaoh laughs at him. He says, okay, this is what God has commanded. You're going against God. I don't think you're ready for that. What happens? We see plague after plague after plague. Ten plagues. Ten plagues. The tenth plague. The death of the firstborn. And so God speaks to Moses and says, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. Chapter 12. You don't believe me? Read chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12. You must have an unblemished animal. Slaughter the animal at twilight. Take the blood. Wipe it on the doorpost. Kind of nasty, right? This is kind of nasty. But this is what God tells me to do. Verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt. Both people and animals. I am the Lord. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so they do that. They do that. Those who fear the Lord are walking with the Lord, are obedient to the Lord, take an animal, sacrifice, put the blood on the doorpost. And that night, the Spirit of God moves through. And the only firstborns that are saved are those who have the blood on the doorpost. As we look to that, we we look ahead and and we we look at a text like Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We're able to look at that and say, the sacrificial lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. He took my sins, took them to the cross, nailed them to the cross so that I could be forgiven, that I could be set free, that I could have a future. There's a purpose for your life. Look at verse 29. By faith they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. So finally Pharaoh's like, hey, that's it. After that 10th plague, he's like, man, that's it. You guys go. So they start marching. They start marching. They come to this Red Sea. They're crying about, how are we going to get across this Red Sea, right? They they march right up to it. How are we going to get? And by faith, by faith, they cross the Red Sea. Again, scholars estimate somewhere about 2.4 million people. A lot of times in like Sunday school, right? You ever grow up up in church, Sunday school? It's like we think like 2,000 people. No, no, no. Like 2.4 million people. Could you imagine trying to move 2.4 million people, by the way? I mean, some of you have families of five, four kids, and you're like, I don't know how. I don't even know how. I can't even move them, right? You know what I'm saying? And 2.4 million. By faith, they crossed it. Think about it this way. It all started by the faith of Moses' no-named parents. And you're thinking, like, what could God ever do in my life, through my life, with my life? What's your excuse? No, God, we see clearly God can do whatever he wants to do. And I believe that you, there's no accident that you were created, that there's a purpose in all of our lives. And 
so we know they crossed through the Red Sea. And as they're crossing through the Red Sea, the Egyptians, like, change their mind, right? Oh, now, no, we're not going to let them go. We're going to try to kill them all. 2.4 million, that's, 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 I don't know how. But anyways, they're, 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 start, they're crossing through that Red Sea. We, we know, you know the story. I mean, the, the sea opens up, right? It's, they're walking on dry land. It's craziness. And they look back and they're, oh, you know, you're putting us in a situation to kill us. No, no, no. As they get through, the Egyptians start coming through that opening and God closes it and kills them all. Don't take my word for it. Read, read the scriptures for yourself. I'm reminded of the scripture I read just a moment ago. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. Now, this is a different context, but, 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 but hear the heart. Hear the heart. I will be with you when you pass through waters. And, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. You will not be scorched when you walk through the fire, and the flame will not burn you. I, I love this, this, this scripture. I love the truth of the scripture. I hold on to the scripture in days where, I mean, the water's up to here, and I'm like, God, I'm about to drown. No, no, you're not. But I'm here. I'm walking with you. Man, those, those tests that get a little hot, you know what I'm talking about? When the fire starts coming up, God, where are you? And I'm right here. I haven't left. And I just want to encourage you today choose to obey by faith. I must choose to obey by faith. I don't know what it, what it is, but the decisions you need to make, only you can get along with the Lord and answer that between you and the Lord. Can I just encourage you to choose to obey my faith? Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes just for a moment? Each experience, we give you the opportunity to just get alone with God just for a minute. what a chaotic world we live in. So before we step back into the chaos, just just for a moment, say, Lord, what is my response? What is my response to your word today? What is my response to your word and I don't know if there's someone here maybe that you've never surrendered your life over to Jesus can I just let you know I believe that would be your first response salvation and you're like what, what is salvation salvation is the surrender of your life over to his you're no longer boss of your life he's boss of your life believe that there's no way to salvation but through Jesus the Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved and so as people are praying all over this place if that's your heart's desire today would be salvation that would be the best decision I believe you could ever make so as people are praying all over this place Lord what is my response listen if you don't know that you know that you know could today be the day that you walk out knowing with confidence, not in yourself, but in the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you pray with me? Something like this. If you're you're struggling, you've been wrestling with that, and you don't know, would you just pray something like this from your heart to God's heart? Listen, he, he, he's listening. He's been pursuing you. There's no accident here. So would you just pray with me? Something like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I need you today to forgive me. To save me. To clean me up. I believe that you came to this earth. That you died on a cross. stay dead in that grave when you rose victorious from me so I put all my trust and hope in you so Lord I, I pray 
and that if there's someone here that that's the first time they've cried out to you Lord I pray I pray you would encourage them that you would speak to them that they would spend time talking to you spend time in your word to let us know uh, here at Discovery that we can walk alongside of them help them with next steps Lord thank you for the promises of your word that you will never leave us or turn your back on us you will never forsake us